Hello, friends, colleagues, collaborators, customers, and scientific thinkers. My name is Michael Mohammadi, and I'm the Director of Sales and Technical Services for Thor Labs. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar that brings a new flavor of non-photonics but scientifically relevant topics to our guests. Today's talk features Dr. Bradley Alger, Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, Brad completed his undergrad work at UC Berkeley and his PhD at Harvard, then went on to become Roger Nicole's first postdoc, where he used electrophysiology to investigate inhibitory signaling in the hippocampus. Brad has over 100 publications to his credit, including a seminal paper in the field of neuronal signaling that demonstrated for the first time a mechanism of retrograde signaling in the mammalian brain, later shown to be mediated by endocannabinoids. Brad's a champion of the hypothesis-based thought and scientific method, and in 2019 published his book, Defense of the Scientific Hypothesis, which he'll talk about today. In a time of misused data, fake news, and dissolving trust of science, Brad's work reminds us all the importance of a well-tuned scientific mind. I've had the pleasure of knowing Brad for over 15 years, both as a scientific educator and a mentor, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Just a reminder, questions can be submitted throughout the talk and will be addressed at the end. Uh, questions will be submitted using the Q&A button right at the top of your screen. Um, and with that said, I'll hand it over to Brad. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for that uh, kind introduction and for the invitation to give this webinar today. And thank you all for, uh, for joining me. This is a topic which might be a little bit unfamiliar to some of you, but it's uh, very important. It's something we use all the time. Uh, and that is the idea of scientific thinking. It is a skill that's learned, however. It's even though it's something that uh, one might not think of in that way all the time. Now, as Michael mentioned, I uh, think this topic is important enough that I wrote a book. It's actually kind of a long book. It's 400 pages long. And of course, we won't be going over much of it today. In particular, I'm not going to talk much about the defense of the hypothesis because uh, although that's an important topic and there are, are, are notable uh, scientists who have actually written books denigrating the hypothesis and saying it's no longer necessary for uh, science, uh, I obviously don't believe that. But again, I'm going to focus today just on the hypothesis itself. The reason for that is that uh, its key role in some of the main jobs of science, which I define as uh, discovering new knowledge about the world, but then, and equally importantly, communicating that knowledge to society at large in our scientific community. Now, the fact is, I'll show you a little bit of evidence to suggest that how we think about, write about, and understand science uh, has uh, plenty of room for improvement. And I think that the scientific hypothesis is the single most useful tool in, available for making improvements along this line. Now, uh, I first got interested in this topic while teaching a, a graduate seminar, pro seminar for first, gra first year graduate students uh, with a senior colleague. And it turned out that sometimes uh, he and I disagreed about fundamental matters of the scientific hypothesis. And this, this actually began to bother me. It was uh, actually kind of alarming to think that we're out there teaching a subject and we don't even agree on the subject itself. And after a little communication, we realized that uh, neither one of us had actually ever had any formal training in scientific thinking, the scientific method, the hypothesis, and so on. And again, with some informal uh, chat with uh, colleagues, we found this was uh, fairly common. So I, I did a survey. I put together a survey monkey survey of several uh, thousand, actually, members of scientific societies. Now, I should say at the outset, these are mainly biological societies, the societies of experimental biology, including neuroscience. Uh, and so the remarks I uh, make about this survey, and I'll show you a number of, of graphs that, of the data that I got from that, um, uh, they're from biologists. And, and whether the experience of the biology community is really the same as uh, that of the hard sciences, chemistry and physics, for example, um, I don't know, but maybe you'll uh, keep that in mind anyway, because uh, it may be relevant. In any case, the, the, well, an early question I asked was, was how much formal uh, training had you received? Uh, and I got, uh, as I mentioned, I, uh, about uh, several hundred uh, responses to each one of the questions that I'll show you. But anyway, so you can see from the graph that uh, by far the majority, 70%, had either no training or a very small amount, less than an hour or so. And I thought at first, well, uh, maybe that's because we do, uh, we get it uh, all through this sort of osmotic process where we acquire a lot of our knowledge. We get it through 
journal clubs and seminars and we read papers and we talk with colleagues, uh, maybe we just don't need any formal training. And so I asked uh, my group, uh, what do you think about that? Would it be useful? And to my uh, surprise, 92% said they'd actually find more formal training in these kind of uh, uh, ideas uh, to be quite useful. And so the talk today is really predicated on the idea that you, the audience, are a member of one or maybe both of these groups. And so from that point of view, I'm going to start with um, fairly basic matters in the hypothesis, what it is. I'll define some terms in ways that you may uh, seem familiar, but may, may be a little bit different. I'm then going to talk about the principle of uncertainty and Karl Popper, the philosopher of science uh, who's quite famous in his idea, especially of falsification of ideas. Um, I'll then switch to uh, basic and applied science and show how uh, those concepts, although they're, they're sort of familiar to us, really have some aspects which aren't brought out very much and I think yet are very important uh, for the science uh, as we understand it, but also as we communicate uh, to the society at large. And finally, I'll finish with a few uh, more remarks on uh, communications and science and how we might improve them. Well, okay, to begin with, so what is the scientific hypothesis and how is it different from a prediction? And a, a hypothesis, I'll say, is a potential explanation uh, for an observation or a phenomenon. It says why things are the way they are. Uh, and on the other hand, a prediction is simply a statement of what you think will happen, maybe as a result of some experimental manipulation. But a prediction itself doesn't explain anything. Now, with these two simple ideas in mind, we can actually uh, learn a few things about science. For instance, um, what is the relationship between hypotheses and predictions? This is the key relationship, I think, in all experimental science. Uh, and the relationship really is a logical one. We deduce predictions from hypotheses. And what that means is, that if you understand the terms of the hypothesis, the words and so on and what they mean, then the predictions follow immediately and logically as a necessary result of that hypothesis. So we say the predictions are implied by the hypothesis or conversely that hypotheses make predictions. Now, this relationship is key because if the hypothesis is true, the predictions it makes must be true. And this is the deductive relationship. On the other hand, if the prediction is false, the hypothesis is false. Now, what happens if the prediction is true, which happens a lot? Well, it turns out we really can't conclude as much as we'd like to from that because the hypothesis might or might not be true. It turns out that many hypotheses may make the same prediction. And so the key thing from the point of view of experimental science really is this relationship where the uh, a false uh, prediction will in fact imply that the hypothesis itself is false. Now, this argument then leads to two important principles. One is that a hypothesis must be testable, meaning that it must make at least one prediction that could reveal that it is wrong, that the hypothesis is wrong or has been falsified. Uh, it also implies then that testing requires doing those experiments that could reveal that uh, the hypothesis itself is wrong. Now, I'm just going to take a side uh, step here to explain uh, something which bothers people sometimes. I focus on the hypothesis. Well, what about theories and laws? These are things we often hear about. Uh, how are they related and are they equally important? And the reason I focus on the hypothesis is that I believe that the concepts of theories and laws often aren't as well defined and they're certainly not used consistently, I think, across science. I'll just give you a few examples of that. Uh, for one thing, we have uh, in, in uh, cosmology and in fact in, in paleobiology, we have the, the, con the, the Alvarez hypothesis uh, developed by Walter and Luis uh, Alvarez, father-son team, of dinosaur extinction. And this is the, the famous idea whereby uh, about 66 million years ago, uh, an asteroid slammed into the Earth, set up this enormous dust cloud, obscured the sun, triggered volcanism and acid rain and wiped out the dinosaurs. This is a theory, this is a, a theory, I would say, yeah, that has been uh, studied for about 40 years now. It's very quantitative, the great amount of data supporting it of all kinds, very precise data, and yet it's called a hypothesis. Uh, at the end, other end of the scientific scale, if we go to the soft sciences, uh, so-called uh, psychology and social sciences, you'll find that the word theory is uh, used very easily. The theories are announced all the time with far less 
uh, support than we would find in other branches of science. Uh, turning to my field, which is neuroscience, we find, interesting enough, there really aren't any theories in science. Scientists don't, uh, neuroscientists don't see themselves as testing theories at all in general, although you could make the argument there might be some. Uh, theory is not a word that we use. And uh, finally, when we go to the queen of sciences and look at particle physics, there's this uh, wonderful and extensive and quantitative uh, theory that accounts for the three of the main forces of nature and all of the subatomic particles and their interrelationships. It has predicted the properties and the existence of some of them, and yet it's called the standard model of, si of particle physics. On the other hand, the word hypothesis, I think, and this is sometimes used uh, equivalently to the word model, uh, this word hypothesis is fairly consistent across all of science. So that's that's one argument in favor of focusing on it. Another is there's really a great deal of similarity between all of these concepts, whether they're theories, uh, models, the uh, laws or hypotheses, they're all tentative proposed explanations for some aspect of nature. They all make testable predictions and they can be falsified, but not proven to be true. Now, uh, I'd like to say a brief word about uh, the hypothesis and other kinds of science. I've been talking about hypothesis-based science, but not all science is based on testing hypotheses. Hypotheses are explanations, and, and therefore you, you can see right away that they're really not needed. They don't have a place if there's nothing uh, really to explain. And yet uh, some people have, have uh, argued that, well, we don't need hypotheses because uh, we have these other kinds of science, as if you had to make a choice between uh, one kind of science and another. And I believe that in fact, the hypothesis-based science is really quite compatible uh, and not opposed to many other kinds of science that are sometimes put forward as alternatives. So for example, we all have to do uh, some exploratory data gathering, sometimes called discovery science. Uh, we do open-ended questioning. Sometimes just a question just occurs to us and we launch off without having a hypothesis formed in advance. And there's also systems biology and big data, uh, which have both been proposed as alternatives to hypothesis-based science. And for the most part, again, I, I don't think that uh, we have to make that distinction. So let's look at a brief example just to illustrate in a simple way some of these ideas. Here's a a lake near your house maybe, and you notice one day that there are fish uh, are dying in, in the lake. And uh, you wonder why, and you notice that uh, not too far away, maybe in a nearby state, there's a concentration of heavy industry, and there's a lot of uh, a smoke and a fluvy of all kinds going up the stacks into the clouds, uh, and that uh, you, you form the hypothesis that maybe what's happening is that uh, the pollution, uh, air pollution from uh, these, uh, this nearby industry is causing acid rain and that's killing the fish. So that's your hypothesis. That's an explanation for the, for the dead fish issue. Now, if you think about it, you see how, how complicated even this simple idea is. Uh, there are an awful lot of number, there are awful uh, many uh, steps and details in this. It's very complex. And there's no one way you could easily test uh, that that complex hypothesis. You can't test it directly, we'll say. But the hypothesis makes many predictions of things that have to be true if that hypothesis is true. And so one of them might be, for example, that the lake water will be acidic, right? And that's a simple, straightforward thing. We can test that right away by getting a pH meter a sample of water and, and testing the lake water. Now, now notice that if the pH of the lake water were neutral, then the acid rain hypothesis would be false. I would suggest. Uh, and on the other hand, if the prediction is true, that is the lake water is acidic, it still doesn't prove the hypothesis. We don't know if the fish are dying, for example, for, for the uh, reason of the uh, acid rain and so on and so forth. So this illustration uh, lets us see how the relationship between hypotheses and predictions can be extended a little bit. We test scientific hypotheses indirectly by testing their predictions. And on the other hand, we test the predictions directly by making a measurement, right? And we can tell right away whether the prediction is true or false, whether the measurement agrees with the hypothesis or doesn't agree. And on the other hand, as I've said before, hypotheses themselves, uh, we can tell if they're false, but not really uh, whether they're true. Now, people sometimes mix up hypotheses and predictions, and I've read this even in scientific papers. You'll see a statement such as this, I hypothesize that the pH of this water is acidic. Uh, 
Well, if, if you think about it, uh, the re word really is I've defined it should be predict because uh, the uh, statement doesn't uh, explain anything, right? We're not going to know, uh, we're not going to have an explanation for anything uh, if we understand the pH of the water is acidic. And, and in any case, we're simply going to get a pH meter and see whether or not uh, it is acidic. On the other hand, we could do similar measurements as, uh, as we've just reviewed in the context of a hypothesis because the hypothesis of acid rain, for example, predicted that the water would be acidic. And that had some significance. We measured the pH of uh, the water to test the hypothesis, and then that test reflected back on the truth of the hypothesis. So you can make the same measurement. It isn't the measurement itself that determines whether it's a prediction or a hypothesis, but really the context of it and the significance of it are, are what we need to keep track of. Now, if you remember that the scientific hypothesis is an explanation, I think this also goes away to clarifying another confusion, which I think is very common uh, even among scientists, and that is confusing statistical hypotheses with scientific hypotheses. Statistical hypotheses are, uh, as you remember, uh, they are often used in a very simple way to determine whether two groups are similar or uh, or not. Uh, and for example, there might be, a, we might have one group that's indicated by uh, the, the uh, uh, normal curve to the left, uh, which is a distribution of values under uh, the conditions, uh, under standard conditions without treatment. We then do some experimental treatment and we, we imagine then that uh, the treatment may have altered the population such that the values uh, in the distribution are different. And we would do some statistical tests. We'd set up uh, something in the most basic way called a null hypothesis, which would say that the treatment had no effect whatsoever. And we do our appropriate statistical test and we would either accept or reject the null hypothesis. But the, the null hypothesis and other statistical hypotheses you can see are really just part of a mathematical testing procedure. Um, they don't really explain anything. They're, uh, uh, they're, they're simply determining whether two groups in, in a typical case, two groups are the same or not, uh, and they're tested directly. We simply do uh, a, a method, we, we execute our, our scientific, uh, our statistical test, and we, we get the answer to the question. So, uh, and finally, statistical hypotheses are often used to test predictions of scientific hypotheses, and in some way, they're much more similar uh, to predictions than, um, uh, than, than the hypothesis themselves. Now, uh, other differences between scientific and statistical hypotheses uh, make the, make the uh, point in, in a slightly different way. And if we think about how we test scientific hypotheses, uh, well, we can do that in a whole variety of ways. The scientific hypothesis, after all, is about the empirical world. And there are a number of tests that we can uh, do almost for any experiment, uh, any hypothesis to see whether it's true or not. It makes predictions in a wide variety of ways. And so scientific hypotheses really test concepts. And on the other hand, statistical hypotheses are at the end of the day, they're about numbers. When we've done our measurements, we've got our values, our mean, standard deviations, and all those things, the distribution of values. We submit it to a statistical test, which uh, then uh, is, uh, is processed and we get the answer to uh, the, the, uh, the question. So statistical uh, hypotheses and scientific hypotheses are really fundamentally quite different. Now, let's go to the uh, uh, re look again at the major goal, one of the major goals of science, which is to discover true hypotheses about nature. And I've, I've emphasized the word true here and, and it's leading to truth uh, because this is the idea that science is really after the statements which will be true about the universe. They're true forever and they apply everywhere. And they're obviously that those are unachievable goals, and I'll come back to that in a little while. The question is, okay, how, how can science proceed to get to truth uh, in the world? And historically, there have been two main answers to how this is done. Uh, one is through inductive reasoning or induction, and two is hypothesis testing. What is inductive reasoning? Just to review quickly, in the simplest sense, it's uh, the process by which we observe a pattern of events uh, phenomena and so on in the world, in nature, and we attempt to generalize it to some general rule and, and uh, reach uh, some understanding about the world. So, for example, if we thought about that abstractly, uh, we might see a series of events or phenomena, we'll, uh, we'll call it A, B, and C, uh, and we've studied this pattern and we, we believe we have a rule, a hypothesis, and uh, we, uh, 
sorry, a general rule, and we might extend, we might imagine that the uh, series would continue in this way. But of course, uh, we don't know how it, it, it uh, ex is extended, and, and therefore, uh, by induction, we, we don't know whether we should prefer any one of these three different alternatives. And so the question is, can we, by inductive reasoning alone, arrive at truths about the world? And so the uh, classical, from uh, philosophy anyway, the classical kind of test about this was to uh, consider the following. We, we, uh, we see, uh, we're outside, we see a bunch of swans, these big white birds, and they're all white. And we decide that maybe an explanation for that is that all swans are in fact white. And the question is, can we induce such a true principle that all swans are white uh, in this inductive way? How could we be sure, in other words, that this principle is in fact true? How many swans would we have to observe to know that it's true? And if you think about it a little while, uh, in fact, we'd have to uh, see all possible swans, all past, present, and future swans, all things that would ever be called swans, in order to be certain that all swans are white. And then, of course, uh, if in fact we did succeed somehow in observing all possible swans, uh, then we would have to just describe the set of observations we've made, and induction itself would play no role. And so it was, it was, uh, Considerations like these that left the uh, famous philosopher Karl Popper to uh, reject the idea that you can use the inductive method to arrive at truths about the world, because no number of apparently confirmatory observations can guarantee that the next observation would be uh, wouldn't be contradictory. So, so what do we do then? Uh, well, Popper said, on the other hand, if we think about it, how many observations do we have to make to conclude that not all swans are white? And his answer was one. If we notice a, ver a veritably, uh, verifiably uh, uh, black animal uh, that is nevertheless a swan, then we have disproven the idea that all swans are white. And so disproof or also called falsification of a statement about the world is possible, we're going to start at some point, again, when we have a problem that needs a solution, we're going to propose a hypothesis that we think is true. We are then going to test it severely, and that means to see whether or not it might be false. If we don't succeed in falsifying the, uh, the, the hypothesis, then, then what are we left with? And it turns out, well, we're left with a hypothesis that we think is true. And in fact, our scientific facts are, in, are this collection of tested and not yet falsified hypotheses. We have to keep in mind, however, that all of these facts and all facts are never going to be certain. That is beyond any question. And so the scientific process is very much like this. We have a fairly low bar. Science will take in any number of hypotheses. It'll subject them to tests and it will basically classify them as either false, having been falsified as a result of the testing, or not falsified. And once again, what science knows is our collection of tested and not yet falsified hypotheses. And this is not exactly the view of science that many people have, and I'll, I'll allude to some of these uh, kind of complications in the next few slides. Uh, but first, I want to talk about some misconceptions about the process of falsification. And you read all these things, even by philosophers, that falsification only leaves you with rejected hypotheses, or it's a good way to finding out what is untrue, not what is true, and the purpose is to find incorrect hypotheses. And, and therefore, they, they're trying to, uh, the, the argument is that this whole process is nonsensical. But I argue that, um, and, and many people would, of course, that in fact, it makes a lot of sense. And if you think, for example, about an analogy in the real world, if you wanted to create an object, let's say the perfect tire for your car or truck, um, you would severely, uh, you, in your manufacturer, you would severely uh, test your prototype tires. You'd make a variety of prototypes and you'd test them severely in, in all kinds of conditions, expecting and hoping and trying to make them fail and, and you'd reject the failures. Now, this process would leave you uh, with a lot of uh, ruined tires, right? You have piles of ruined rubber all the time, but that's not the purpose of the testing. It's not to produce the tires. And similarly, uh, the main product of the testing is not uh, the ruined tires. The fact is that what we're doing is by testing it, we're trying to learn what works and avoid what doesn't work. And that is the essence of the scientific uh, process for Popper. If, if things are 
fundamentally uncertain, as we've said they are, then the very best we can do is try to avoid error. And we don't want to accept as true something that in fact is false. Now, this idea of scientific truth, however, is a little bit trickier than I've been making it uh, seem up till now, because it turns out that we have to think about truth in different ways, at different levels of science, and for different purposes. And to illustrate that, I'll start off with a little simple question here. Can we prove that scientific facts that we discover are definitely 100% true, true in the sense that I talked about earlier? And of course, we all know from our elementary uh, science classes that we, we're supposed to answer no to this. We're supposed to say, no, you cannot do that. And the question is, um, do, do we really believe it? Uh, and, and I find that even uh, scientists, even good rigorous science, when, it, when you really get down to it, they somehow don't quite believe that. They believe that there are things they found or their colleagues have found that are 100% true without question. And indeed, if you, if you think about this idea, which is also called fallibilism, that the, the idea that things can't be 100% true, um, if, if, you, if you think about it, it, it's kind of a silly idea. I mean, don't we know some things for sure? I mean, doesn't the Earth go around the sun in an elliptical orbit, for example? Um, doesn't, in my field, doesn't the nervous system, uh, isn't it made up of discrete neurons? Is something we believe for over 100 years. Surely uh, these things must be true. So, so let's look at this. If we, if we look from some points of view, uh, well, surely the Earth, uh, as Newton told us, it goes around the sun in an elliptical orbit. Um, and, uh, and, and so that seems to be true. On the other hand, if we take a step back and we look at it from a slightly larger point of view, we realize that the, uh, the sun is not stationary. It's moving in space and it's, it's also not moving in a straight line. It's moving with respect to the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is moving with respect to the other galaxies and the local cluster. The universe is expanding and so on and so forth. And so we have these two different views of scientific truth. And one, I will say, is what the truth that is is uh, that we use, that we look for and we apply in applied science. Uh, and this is the, the level at which uh, the the uh, hypotheses and the truths we arrive at support actions. In the uh, from the other point of view, however, we have basic science, and this is this is where the search for ultimate truth, truth in that big uh, T uh, sense that I talked about before, it is really quite important. So, for basic science, the Earth does not go around the sun in an elliptical orbit. On the other hand. For applied science, it surely does. And we always act, our actions are always based on uh, this incomplete uh, semi-knowledge uh, that we get uh, that is nevertheless good enough for us to take action on. And, and uh, I want to come back to that concept in a minute. First, I'd like to, to uh, emphasize one other kind of point. This comes from neuroscience. And over 100 years ago, the late, uh, actually the early 1900s, uh, there was a famous dispute among these uh, ultimate Nobel laureates, uh, Ramon Cajal and uh, Santiago Ramon Cajal and uh, Camilo Golgi, and they had different pictures of what actually happened uh, when two neurons uh, come together. And for Cajal, one neuron stopped and the other one started. This little cleft is called the synapse, the synaptic cleft where information goes across. And for Golgi, uh, this is a small, tight, restricted area, but in fact, the cells were in uh, physical continuity. And so uh, this was the dispute. And uh, when uh, in the early 1970s, when I was in graduate school, we saw pictures like this. This is an electron micrograph of the same kind of setup. This is a synapse here. And you can see there's a clear cleft. There's a gap where one cell stops, the projection of one cell stops, there's a gap, and then another cell. And so this looks like the physical discontinuity that Cajal had in mind. And in fact, the conclusion at that time was, uh, there's the proof that Cajal is, is certainly right about his ideas. But uh, in recent years, uh, scientists led in, in part by uh, my colleague at the University of Maryland, Tom Blanpete in his, his uh, laboratory, uh, found that in fact, there's a very remarkable correlation uh, in the arrangement of molecules, very specifically lined up and coordinated across this gap, uh, which can hardly be due to chance. And uh, Tom uh, and his colleagues proposed there must be uh, something they call the nano column, that is a physical uh, continuity. And indeed, 
when other scientists went and looked uh, in that same region, again, this is the same blow up of the synaptic cleft here, uh, they, they found a whole variety of molecules, quite large in many ways, that projected out from one neuron, uh, in fact, all the way across, I'm just sh not showing the connection, but all the way across and making uh, connection, physical connection with uh, partner molecules on the other side of the cleft. So there is a structural uh, connectivity between the pre and the postsynaptic neurons. And in recent years, it's been found that there are functional consequences of this, that some of the molecules on the presynaptic side in contacting their partners on the postsynaptic side actually trigger physiological reactions, which then feed back in and interact with uh, the, the uh, mar molecules from the descending cell. And, and so what's happened now is that we can see that uh, actually Cajal uh, was wrong. There is, uh, at least I would say, there is uh, evidence for structural and functional connectivity between the cells. Uh, but Golgi was also wrong, that it's not the contiguity, the, the cytoplasmic continuity that he envisioned. And, and we, can, we can learn, I think, two lessons from this. One is that the new knowledge here led to qualitative changes in understanding. It wasn't that we got a better and better idea of which of these uh, these uh, famous scientists was right, but we realized we have to change our whole concept of how things uh, of how things are, are arranged uh, in the brain. And this also tells us that the notion of uncertainty of science is often apparent at different levels of analysis. And and I should say that. Just as in the case of the applied and basic science I, that I talked about before, there are conditions under which we are quite free to continue to ignore the fact that what I just showed you, that is where there is evidence for uh, connectivity, because in fact, you can still learn a lot by treating cells as independent entities. And in fact, that's what through my entire 40 year experimental career, that's what we did. Um, and yet that's still an important and useful picture when we're developing uh, drugs that can treat, uh, for instance, epilepsy or Alzheimer's disease, it's still quite convenient and quite informative to act as if the cells are independent entities, despite the fact that we know that ultimately we're going to have to get uh, an entirely uh, different concept of how uh, communication goes on in the brain. Now, this lack of clarity, however, in the uh, in the concept of these different levels is is exploited by people and this is where the notion of clarity of communication uh, becomes very important because we know that that uh, there are uh, climate change deniers and the tobacco companies that create doubt uh, in the public's mind and sometimes in scientists mind about what science actually knows and one of the techniques is by obscuring the difference that i've been talking about between applied and basic science I mean, we often hear, for example, well, we can't do anything about uh, climate change because all of the data are not yet in. And the same is said with tobacco, smoking and cancer. All the data are not yet in. Therefore, we can't do anything. But what has this done, really? We know that all the data uh, will never be in for basic science. And so we keep investigating. So so the idea that all the data are not in is certainly true. But I would say it's also irrelevant in the sense that we know that we don't need all of the data uh, for applied science to support actions. We can do things as we as we always do, as we inevitably do, based on our very best, though incomplete, our very best current understanding of of uh, of, of the universe. Now, this suggests then that the role of communication between scientists and between science and the public is a, a critical matter and one that I'll show you, we, we, we're we not always doing a great job uh, at, at uh, and, and partly for the reason uh, that I'll show you, I think we're just not as clear about our ideas as, as we ought to be. And, and this, uh, this came home to me when I was, uh, as part of this survey that I've mentioned once or twice already and shown you a little bit of data from, um, I, I asked my survey respondents um, how they use the hypothesis. Did they, for example, did they uh, stated in their papers when they when they write up their scientific work, do they do they refer to the hypothesis? And it turned out that 76% of my sample, 76% said they always or usually stated their hypothesis in their papers. 
So, so then I went to the papers and I analyzed, in this case, uh, 158 papers. Actually, I'm up over 200 now. Uh, and I analyzed them uh, as much as I could. These were neuroscience papers. So, of course, I can't be sure that these papers were produced by this group of uh, scientists that you see on the left, the, my sample size on the left, uh, but on the idea with, with the assumption anyway that these are relatively uh, representative kinds of groups, both of people and of papers. Maybe we can learn something. Um, what I found was that as I classified the papers as uh, being driven uh, by hypothesis testing or model testing or theory testing or uh, not, uh, but organized around uh, an applied hypothesis or some other things, that I saw something that was really quite remarkable, and that is that only 18% of the papers explicitly tested a hypothesis or model. Now, I was really looking for the words hypothesis and model, as well as the logic. Did they say they were doing it? Did the uh, paper hold together in a, in a way that showed that it was indeed testing a scientific hypothesis, by the way, not a statistical one? And uh, the, first, the first thing you can notice, however, is this great discordance between uh, the report of uh, my, my sample size that people said, most of them said, uh, they usually are always stated. On the other hand, the evidence of the sample of literature was that, uh, in fact, it was rarely stated uh, in, in any explicit way. Uh, and I wondered why. And at first, then I realized that, that this category here, where I could infer that there was a hypothesis in there somewhere, uh, the experiments weren't random, it wasn't a discovery science kind of project. There was a certain goal in mind. Uh, the experiments followed in logical order. Um, that this was actually uh, the largest single group of uh, uh, of uh, 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 papers or methods, uh, uh, modes, I guess you could say, uh, that I found. And, but the question was why? Why, and when they had hypotheses, when they stated, in fact, they were using hypotheses, uh, didn't my scientific group uh, really acknowledge that in their papers? And I, I considered a couple different possibilities for this. So uh, again, I go back to my sample and I said, well, what do you think about the hypothesis? I mean, maybe maybe I, I, I haven't really uh, assessed their attitudes correctly. So I said, well, what do you think about the hypothesis? And I, I gave them a choice. I said, uh, there may be advantages and disadvantages. I gave them a list of disadvantages. There are eight or nine of them. And they were free, the respondents were free to pick as many as they liked or none, uh, and whichever ones they thought were important. Uh, I then, of course, uh, did uh, the same with advantages. I gave them a series of advantages and asked uh, them to select those or not. And it turns out, the first thing you can see is that they selected many more advantages uh, than disadvantages, and they seem to uh, uh, feel uh, quite strongly about these things. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting in the present context, however, when I looked to see uh, what kind of advantages they were selecting, the the uh, things that showed up best, the reason they thought the the, science, the hypothesis was was best for was helping them uh, think clearly and organize their thoughts as well as to communicate. They found hypothesis based papers easier to read uh, and to understand and uh, that the communication was fostered by having a hypothesis. Well, this this left me then uh, with the idea that in fact it wasn't uh, a, a a lack of uh, of uh, uh, approval or, or understanding of the advantage of a hypothesis. So why then, if they agreed that the hypothesis was useful for all these different laudatory kinds of reasons, why didn't they say it in the papers? And I didn't really uh, my my survey wasn't set up in such a way that I could get a good quantitative answer in that, but I did get. Uh, a number of different sorts of responses, and, and some of them were as simply indicated that these individuals didn't didn't like hypotheses. I mean, some people don't like them; they're bad. Uh, other people uh, would give me different kinds of answers, and a common one was, was, well, we wanted to tell a story. Uh, the narrative of the paper flowed better without it, um, as as if as if they were uh, thinking that somehow there was uh, if you that you couldn't tell a good story around a hypothesis. Um, I never understood that. But what I think was was more important in these kinds of things, and I got a lot of answers like these, which pointed really to the um, societal uh, 
influences on how papers are set up. And people would say it's better not to be too explicit and then go on and explain that that somehow um, uh, people would misunderstand or that, that this would be uh, calling attention to the possible uh, uh, limitations of your conclusions. If you were very precise about your hypothesis, people would really understand your paper and they would they would understand uh, that your hypothesis was limited and could be tested. And others would say it was aggressive and nobody else does it. And, and the reason I think that this class, this group of, um, of explanations is, is too bad was that th these are this is fixable. And I think to the extent that we think that uh, scientific hypotheses really do um, make for more efficient communication, which is what uh, my group said it did, which is what they thought, uh, as well as for clearer thinking of the individuals using it. Uh, many people uh, reported that when they are thinking, when they externalize, when they objectify their hypothesis and make it clear, make it explicit, uh, write down uh, the uh, the predictions that it makes. In fact, and I haven't emphasized this, and, and I ought to have, um, an ideal way of doing a scientific uh, uh, projects and uh, engaging in hypothesis-based research is not to think of just one explanation for your phenomenon, but if you if you can think of many explanations, multiples anyway, uh, it keeps you from being biased, but it also helps you think more deeply and clearly about the problem. And so with these number of advantages of the hypothesis, I think it, it, it's really something that, uh, that we can work on, that we should work on. And uh, again, until I, I had uh, done the survey, I was unaware of what a uh, uh, you know what a a problem it can be having people avoid uh, stating their hypothesis when especially when they clearly have them. So um, maybe I'm a little ahead of time, but I'm uh, in in summing up the things that we've touched on. I think that scientist uh, science uh, is uh, its jobs are to discover and disseminate. Uh, knowledge about nature and, and communication, the dissemination of knowledge in many ways, I think is as important as discovering it in the first place. Hypotheses are proposed explanations for phenomena, for problems we see or questions we have, but predictions are not explanations. They're tightly related to hypotheses. They're necessary for hypotheses and hypothesis testing, but they're not themselves the explanations. It's important to keep in mind the statistical hypotheses are not scientific hypotheses. And I have a feeling that this is something which uh, may have confused uh, the group that I, I uh, query because they uh, uh, may have sometimes confused the, the two together. Scientific facts are tested and yet, yet falsified hypotheses. And all of our information is uncertain at some level. I think it's important and overlooked that basic science goals, the goals of basic science fundamentally different different in many ways from the goals of applied science. And I think keeping that distinction straight would help uh, in a lot of uh, the societal uh, communication and difficulties we have in, uh, in understanding science um, from the point of view of the average citizen. And finally, that the explicit use of the scientific hypothesis can improve a scientific understanding and uh, communication. And I encourage all scientists, anyone listening to me who is actually doing experimental science might publish a paper. I've had some people report uh, that having had a talk or considering something like this has changed their behavior a little bit. They've thought a little bit more deeply about their own hypotheses when they're putting together the next paper. I applaud that and I would encourage uh, all of us to begin at least thinking along these lines and when appropriate, uh, incorporating explicit uh, statements of your thinking, your scientific hypothesis and predictions in your own communications. And so uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to entertain any questions if there are any. That was really great. Thank you, Brad. And as ha having recently read your book, it was nice to see a lot of the concepts presented and now it'll have me go back and try to really understand it in, in text form. Uh, we've got some questions that have been coming in, so I'm just going to go ahead and publish them as I read them. Uh, you showed earlier that big data may or may not be hypothesis driven. Can you expand on this, giving an example of each? Big data is uh, a fascinating phenomenon. That's an excellent question. It's a very it's a very good question. I have a chapter on big data and the hypothesis in the book. Um, I think that big data in it is looked at in two ways. One is simply 
massive amounts of uh, data, often very messy, but really gigantic quantities of it. Uh, it's, uh, and, and people will use it to both find hypotheses. In other words, sometimes uh, in, in, in trying to account for a phenomenon, uh, people will search through these massive databases and look for correlations. And the correlations then are viewed in two different ways, I find. Some scientists see them as giving uh, insight into a hypothesis, which might then be tested more or less in the in the way that we're talking about. But I can also show you that uh, there are big data proponents who uh, adopt what they call a big data mindset. And their uh, thinking is that, well, we don't really need hypotheses anymore. Uh, the world is too complicated for us to understand. It's too vast. There's too much data. We're collecting data everywhere. We can never really understand it. And therefore, the simple-minded concept of human understanding is gradually going to wear away. It's going to go away. And at some point, it won't be necessary for us to really understand anything uh, in science uh, as long as we can find orderly relationships among it. Now, big data is increasingly used, however, uh, simply to test uh, hypotheses. And there are uh, very good examples of, of people, smaller laboratories having access to big data, maybe uh, maybe uh, survey data through, um, uh, you know, uh, Facebook or other other sources in which they're analyzing uh, large uh, groups of uh, human interactions and inferring whether uh, what the group interactions are like, what motivate people to do one thing or another, what people are drawn to other people, uh, how si societies are in fact put together, which in, in a way uh, you, you can hardly get to except through big data. Um, I'm not sure I answered the whole part of that question. Was there anything else, Michael, that uh, I missed? Uh, no, I think that that sums the, it up. So, yeah, so, so, you, you so one, one is, example. So, so, yeah. so, uh, well, uh, so, so one example, which is quite striking, uh, was a, a famous study do, done a couple of years ago where uh, a couple of scientists got access to massive amounts of, uh, 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 uh survey participants, I guess they got, they, they searched social media, uh, and were able to, uh, get from self-identification um, whether people's uh, what gender uh, people's uh, gender identification was they then uh, 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 had these uh, people who would self-identify as uh, as uh, for instance gay or or uh, or straight and um, and asked other individuals human beings whether they could tell just from looking at the pictures of the individuals whether the individuals uh, what their sexual orientation or, or identification was. Uh, they then subjected, uh, submitted the same pictures to uh, an AI uh, 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 program with a large access to data. And in fact, the AI program was turned out to be far better than human beings in identifying uh, the, the sexual orientation of individuals. And yet we had no idea, the scientists themselves had no idea what the AI programs were picking up how they were actually what 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 features of the individuals uh, pictures uh, were being used to identify uh, them. So that was a very controversial, very big uh, uh, study. But that's a, the sort of thing that uh, was done by big data and big computer analyses that that can't be done, couldn't be done by other individuals. I think that was a great example. Thank you, Brad. I'm gonna. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. I'm gonna read two that kind of go together. So if you'll just give me a second, uh, have you seen the use of the hypothesis in publications decreasing over the decades? When I was in college, we had to include a hypothesis in all of our reports. I wonder if this is still the case. And then a, a separate question that addresses that is, what have you heard from journals and their editors about the explicit use or non-use of hypotheses in publications? Well, that's um, that's actually very uh, that's that's been a learning experience for me and kind of disturbing. Um, I had a long conversation uh, quite recently, actually in the past year, with uh, the editor of a very prominent journal in my field, and I said, uh, you know, I, I was just giving my little pitch for a hypothesis and asking about it, and I was told that. Uh, in fact, that that was uh, a mistake, that that although the journal didn't forbid hypotheses, that uh, the editor felt that if, if uh, a scientist was too explicit about the hypothesis, about his or her hypothesis, this could trigger um, 
the uh, reviewers to be too critical. In other words, if they really understood the hypothesis, they would immediately begin spinning out all different kinds of predictions and the paper would get tied up in endless revisions as the hypothesis uh, was uh, repeatedly tested and uh, and so on. And, uh, and therefore that somehow the editor thought that the uh, best strategy would be to sort of insinuate your hypothesis into the paper, kind of get it in there somehow without really um, uh, without really uh, 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 stating it directly. Um, this, needless to say to me, was was quite horrifying. I think that that's exactly the wrong way to go. I would have said, why don't we just educate the reviewers a little bit better on how what's the appropriate way of, uh, of understanding and it reviewing a hypothesis testing paper, uh, given that any hypothesis makes, in fact, an infinite number, really, if you if you think about it, an infinite number of predictions, uh, you'll never be able to test all of them. And so we need to ad adopt some reasonable standards for uh, a good, serious, rigorous test of a hypothesis and realize uh, and, and rate the paper based on uh, the, its ability to uh, achieve the goal that it sets out to do. I guess the other part of that question was, um, have you, you showed some data and papers in the field of neuroscience, but overall, are, do you feel that hypotheses and publications have been decreasing over decades, or is this a more recent phenomenon? I, I have not done a historical uh, view, so I, I don't know. That, I think that's an extremely good question. I wondered about doing that, going back uh, 50 years, let's say, and just getting a, you know, you know, one of the uh, journals, and may in fact, in some cases, the same journals, and, and telling whether uh, they, they do or not. I have a feeling it may not be that different uh, because there's always been a bit of a controversy about the hypothesis, uh, but it's but it's a very good question. I'd, I'd really like to know the answer to that because there is a lot of pushback uh, on the hypothesis, even at the level of the NIH. There are people who question uh, the role of the hypothesis in grants, uh, which, which uh, again, may have a very, in my view, very adverse uh, uh, consequence, but at least confuses substantially the whole grant review process. Excellent. Uh, very good question. Uh, for the next one, um, are hypotheses important for applied science? If yes, then how can we discount people who deny climate change? If no, then what method, in method in quotations, should be used to guide applied science? I, the, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. What I would say is, is this, uh, however, maybe, maybe this would be helpful. When we're, let's look at an, an applied science, let's look at a problem which might be viewed from an applied science or a basic science point of view, such as let's say vaccine development, which is quite important nowadays. Uh, for the basic scientists, nothing short of understanding the, uh, the uh, disease vector in total, all of its uh, branches, all, everything that, that uh, you know, all the genetics involved, the biochemistry involved, uh, but for an applied science uh, point of view, uh, the, the test will be different and the goal will be different. It may be, for instance, if you had a vaccine which uh, was 95% effective uh, as against nothing, if you didn't have any vaccine at all, this would be an enormous triumph, uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, the, the, for a basic scientist, uh, simply a 95% understanding would leave a huge amount which is not understood and you might be entirely on the wrong track. So I think given that uh, applied science has has certain practical goals, then those are the goals that really have to determine uh, how the testing goes. Uh, there will be actually even economic uh, as well as social uh, consequences that have to be taken into account. So it's a little, I think, a little hard to give a, a, a really satisfying anyway answer to uh, the question of, of the um, of how basic science should operate in that case. I think just maybe adding a, an additional question to that from my interpretation of it. Um, can you comment, you know, we all, I, I assume many of us believe that climate change is real and it's likely due to, you know, things that humans have done. How how do you go about with your training and your, th your thought presses around science and the hypothesis? How do you go about addressing those deniers? Um, well, you know, Go ahead. Well, for, first of all, to acknowledge that in some sense, as I said, that they're right. All the data are not in. We don't understand all of it. But but I would but from the from the applied science point of view, I would say that we don't we don't really need to know all. We already know even from our recent experience with the COVID uh, uh, thing, with people staying inside, with not getting out and driving, we've seen dramatic decreases 
in the amount of air pollution in our cities and the clarifying of the air. And so I would say at, at the worst case, we've improved our environment without any question at all, even though we don't understand all of the things that went into that improvement, uh, even though we don't understand all of the chemistry in the atmosphere uh, that'll tell us about uh, climate change, even though we don't understand uh, uh, you know, the details of the, the climate change itself. There have been clear benefits, which is, which is what we often get uh, even from the approximations that we make uh, in the applied science world that are, are good enough to let us take rational, reasonable actions, uh, despite the fact that we don't fully understand. I gave you the example of the neurons in the brain. Uh, there are enormous benefits to be had by taking action based on incomplete knowledge. Uh, again, with, with, a, with the idea that sooner or later, we, we're going to want to have more information. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, and, and we're going to have just um, maybe two more, just in the interest of time. If we can fit in three, we will. Uh, do you think the lack of an explicit hypothesis diminishes the value of a study? I would say uh, it, it probably does not. But I will say that uh, there are a number of reasons, nevertheless, to... Um, uh, to, to wish to have an explicit hypothesis. For example, I, I once did a, a kind of back of the envelope calculation because I just spent almost an hour trying to figure out exactly what the paper was all about, uh, what it could legitimately conclude and what it couldn't conclude. And I thought, gee, if, if I took that hour, even half of it, and multiplied it times the number of papers that are read every year by scientists all around, we're just trying to understand what each other are saying. Uh, that alone would be an enormous benefit in terms of uh, savings of time and money uh, that would uh, that would make it uh, worth worth doing, worth making your hypothesis explicit. So the savings in, in those ways and in, in, in making it more efficient is is one thing. I, I suspect also that some of the uh, the problem we have, the reproducibility and some of the other things, really in some ways are traceable to communications problems. And yes, indeed, in fact, we could probably get these straightened out. But once again, if we're not communicating clearly, then are we sure that we're really replicating, trying to replicate or reproduce each other's studies in the very best way? So sure, the conclusion that you come up with, if it's a good solid conclusion, even though, and it's reproducible and, and uh, you know validly done and all of that, um, the mere fact that you didn't state your hypothesis, I guess, does not uh, detract from that. Although, uh, again, there are lots of reasons still to want to improve things. Okay, this will be the last question, and then I'll I'll end on a a user or a listener's comment. Um, it seems scientific truth is what we know beyond a reasonable doubt, which is in quotations. Is that fair? Uh, yes, I think that is fair. Uh, it's, it's sometimes said that facts are where we agree to let the investigation rest. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's certainly reasonable doubt and not conceivable doubt because, and that's, that's the notion of uncertainty. Uh, the standard of beyond all conceivable doubt suggests a level of certainty we're not going to uh, attain, but, but certainly beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, given, the, what, given what we know, uh, the best information we have, I, I think that's probably a fair way of characterizing it. Great, and we have one minute left, so I'll just, I'll publish and read the last <laughs> comment. Uh, not a question, uh, just a comment. Great presentation, important and timely. Um, I'd like to yeah, echo the sentiment of whoever submitted that, so thank you. And again, on behalf of uh, Thor Labs and everyone who joined today, Brad, we really appreciate you taking time. Uh, wish you great success with your book and look forward to hearing from you again in the future as you continue down this journey of un understanding the hypothesis.